Welcome back to Kerbal Gets Real Redux, everyone. It's been a while since the last episode aired, but we are back and we have a very exciting episode for you today. That's right, we're going to be going to the moon with a crew for the first time. We're also going to be landing something on Venus, sending a probe to the far-flung reaches of Jupiter, and I think that's about it. Well, anyway, let's kick off 1966. So first things first, I mentioned we are going to the moon with a crew and of course that means I need to design some sort of vehicle that will safely take a couple of Kerbals to the moon and back without hopefully killing them. Now the design philosophy, if that's really the right word, that went into this is I've, I've done it quite a few times in this series already before. Basically I want to try and save on tooling as much as possible so the upper stage of this vehicle is done very much much akin to what the Saturn 1B does. That being, I have two sizes of tanks tooled already, and rather than spending a ridiculous amount of Kerbal funds on basically tooling a bigger tank, which is something we do have to worry about in RP1, well, I have gone and used some of the old diameters that I've used, and used them again, that was a lot of used in one sentence, used them again, except I have multiple of them on the stage, and that basically is going to save me such a lot of money when it comes to building this rocket. And really, RP-1, PNLC, the new version of RP-1, well, money seems to always be incredibly tight, especially if I want to be hitting some of those milestones that I do in this series. I, I'm still on track for beating the real-life moon landing, and I did actually stream that months ago, if you want to go check that out. But talking about the moon landing, and one thing that I really should highlight about this mission is that this will be the orbiter that I'm also going to be using when I eventually send two Kerbals, or maybe one I've not quite decided yet, down to the surface of the moon. Well, the design that I am going to be doing for that is capable of taking two, but considering I'm only sending two to orbit the moon, I feel like maybe sending both of them down and leaving the orbiter empty might not be the best of ideas, but that is getting way ahead of myself. That's going to be coming in about 36 at no, no it's, it's probably within the next couple of episodes that we we are going to be looking at a moon landing, like I said. I do want to beat real life. So if I don't do it by 1969, then I have become a massive disappointment to my entire family, the RO community, everyone that sees me on the street, my mate Dave, they will all look down on me forever. If I if I don't do it before 1969. Now this episode seems to be nothing but a massive tangent because what I had on screen there before turning to Shackleton 6 on the 14th of March 1966 was me basically not being able to get to the moon before 1969 because the Colossus Complex wouldn't have been finished until 1972, which is really not good. We will have to figure out a way of increasing that speed. Clearly because I have not uploaded anything in over six months that I've just got so much to say about everything that's going on and I'm just trying to say it all at the same time but I will talk about where I've been a little bit in this episode if I get the chance but right now Shackleton 6 Venus the first attempt at landing something on Venus's hellish surface that is if the game would let me decouple we have sent an orbiter before, we have sent flybys, but this time we are going to attempt to land. And well, we did send a lander before, but unfortunately for me, test flight came along and said, no, you are not going to be landing on Venus today. I don't really know why I channeled my inner withers there. And I think now is as good a time as ever, considering the fact that we are falling ridiculously slow to Venus's surface. Talk about where I've been a little bit. To cut a long story short, I got a job six months ago working in software development and I have been having an absolute blast doing it. Unfortunately, it does mean that my free time to work on these videos has all but dried up. It is getting a little bit better now and hopefully I may be able to get like a video out a month or maybe one every other week, but I'm not going to be able to go back to the sort of schedule that I was on before. So sorry about that. And the next video that likely will be coming out will be my next For All Kerbal Kind episode. But we've landed on Venus and <laughs> 
unfortunately for me, I landed on the side of Venus that wasn't facing Earth, and I'm sure you know that Venus has a ridiculously slow rotation period. So the little orbiter in the sky that is the main communications network for that lander, well, it's not going to be able to talk to Earth for a very long time, and when I got back to the Space Center now, I didn't have an awful lot of science from that mission. I may at some point because that lander is clearly made of stern stuff and can survive Venus's atmosphere, but what I've been doing at the Space Center is trying to get that Colossus complex built a bit faster. But now, we are going to be turning to Garrison 3-4 on the 18th of March 1966. I am not entirely sure why I am launching this. I have said it's been six months since I have done anything on this series, and these videos were actually filmed even longer ago than that. So your guess is as good as mine as to why we are launching another low Earth orbit Garrison. Although that being said, there were some scientific experiments that I could still perform with this launch vehicle, and I want to fit as many launches in an episode as possible. I think because I have now changed back to Earth, Earth is no longer Kerbin, my science is a little bit messed up, so there is some science to be had. I'm sure GLaDOS will be super glad. The cake is a lie on all of that, but that's, that's basically what we're going to be doing. You can see I am doing simple navigation right now, and we have got all of that just from a quick stay in orbit, and of course, EVAs as well, because who doesn't love a good EVA? Jeff, Mr. Blue Lin clearly does. Now, Jeff, Mr. Blue Lin is one of the new Kerbonauts or astronauts. I've still not decided whether to call them astronauts or Kerbonauts because this is Kerbal Space Program, but we, we, we're playing with real solar system. So what does it make them? Or are they cosmonauts? Could we go for something completely different? But we are launching from the United States, so they, they'd more likely be astronauts, I guess. Anyway, we are going to be sending these two brave Kerbals back down. And because this is super sped up, they look incredibly excited on the bottom right of that screen there. They look so happy at their predicament that I am fairly sure that Amanda Wilson might actually wet her son. No, no she's, she's not going to do that because Jeff Mr. Blue Lynn would probably be very disappointed. Although now may not be the time to really worry about that because we are approaching the worst part of any flight and that is of course trying not to roast our kerbals as they come back down through the atmosphere but they are absolutely fine. There was nothing to worry about at all. The Gemini capsule is quite capable and you can see we have deployed a parachute. That's definitely something I've forgotten in the past. And just like that, they are safely back down in the water. Well, absolutely fantastic. Another successful mission for Mr. Jeff Blue Lynn. I completely butchered your name there. Sorry, Blue. And Amanda someone. I can't actually remember her name because she is getting changed. She is a Kerbal that is being renamed after a patron. And I have been playing this a little bit over the past week. And I noticed that she is not a Kerbal in that save because she has been renamed after a patron. Now what we're going to be doing, though, is fast forwarding a a long way into the future, or really the past, because it is 1966, because I'm waiting for, well, basically, the the, 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 the moon mission. The, the mission to the moon to be done. When I also noticed that we have a Jupiter window in 90 days. And that means that we are going to be coming back to the vehicle assembly building for the second time in an episode. What are you? Completely crazy. Do you care about retention? No, I wanted to come back in just to show you the build of Shackleton 7, which is going to be the mission that we do send over to Jupiter. Now, the reason why I'm doing this, I have had many requests to show more of these, so of course I'm going to try and show as many of these as possible, and it's not just to pad out the videos. No. Well, anyway, you can see I've got Transfer Window Planner up, and basically got this up just because I want to know exactly how much rocket juice I am going to need to send this probe over to Jupiter. And it's going to be a lot. It's going to be 7,000-ish meters per second a lot. Yeah, that's it's, it's, it's quite big. Ooh. 
not even big. It's, it's a lot of fuel that we are going to need to burn in order to get there. And the only vehicle that I've got that will be capable of lifting something like this to Jupiter is going to be the Pinnacle, but we'll get to that in a bit. So obviously Jupiter, it's really far away. The sun doesn't really go there very often, which means that solar panels are going to be useless. That means I had to place a huge chunking great RTG on the side of this so that it had power for its entire duration of its trip. If it didn't have that, well, yeah, it would run out of power. And all of these scientific experiments that I'm currently placing on the side, well, they would be nigh on useless. Now, it did make the center of mass completely wonky. It was really not very good in the slightest, but luckily on any procedural avionics core part that you get in RSS RO RP1, there is a beautiful thing called the center of mass shifter. And and I utilized that. I made sure that I made the center of mass as in the middle of the thing as it could be. Uh, because if it wasn't, well then it would, when I fired up the engines on this stage, it would have gone really badly. Like it would have spun out of control like a spinning top that doesn't know where to go when it's at the end of the table and suddenly the cat's got it. Anyway, I did mention we are going to be using a pinnacle launch vehicle to launch this, so I have gone and grabbed one. You could even say that I went and picked up a pinnacle but what I'm doing right now is trying to squeeze as much Delta V out of this final stage as possible before finally realizing I'm done. That's the build finished. And now, in two short hours, we're going to be launching Void 1. Void 1 on the 1st of August 1966, and this is going to be, as the thumbnail says, Earthrise. That's right, it's going to be the first crewed lunar mission of Kerbal Gets Real Redux. And we have two very important Kerbals on board this rocket. We have George Edwards and we have Thierry Petit. And let those engines rip and we are going to make our way to space today. I feel like... Throughout this entire voiceover, right, I've not done voiceovers for about six months. I've, I've done one for work, but I feel like I keep veering off to doing, like, almost the spiffing Brit style of voiceover. The amount of times where I have wanted to go, oh, we're doing this today, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, we're going to be breaking Kerbal Space Program in ways that people really don't know. And that, that completely went off spiffing Brit there, but... Yeah, no, it was, it was, uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why. I need to get back into the swing of things. Anyway, I am completely ruining what I think might be some of the best cinematics I have ever done for at least an episode in Kerbal Gets Real Redux by talking about being completely rubbish with my voiceover. What is going on? I should be talking about the mission at hand. This is Void 1. It is what we saw being built earlier on. It is a Gemini lunar crude capsule that is on top of a pinnacle launch vehicle. One of the earlier pinnacle launch vehicles, because I do know that there is going to be an upgrade coming to these soon. I don't think we've got quite that far yet, but I have in my save. Anyway, second stage fires up successfully. The RL-10s are doing their magic and pushing this into orbit. Now, the third stage of this is going to have a two RL-10 stage engine, and that is basically going to perform, I believe, just the the, the, the whole duration of the mission to the moon. There we go. We, we've cut the engines. We are now in space. Amazing. This is exactly what we wanted to see. Anyway. We're going to decouple the orbiter, the, the lunar section of this mission. And as I was saying, this is powered by two RL-10s. Right now, I am going to be plotting my way out to the moon using Principia. I really like Principia, but I don't like the fact that it doesn't have something like MechJed's auto plot out maneuver. And the fact that I have to plot out every single one of my maneuvers is, well, it, it can get quite tedious, but the, the mod itself is great. Anyway, we're gonna fire up those two engines. Luckily, nothing failed. Now, one thing that would have been really smart for me to do here, which I absolutely did not do, was try and offset those engines ever so slightly so that if one of them did fail it would be more or less still pointing through the center of mass of this stage but I didn't do that so if one of them does fail then well now that we're on our way to the moon there is a very good chance that things could go wrong luckily for me though at this point of the mission everything is still 
absolutely fine. And we have burnt for the moon, we have got a nice close encounter. Everything is very calm, we are on our way. George and Thierry are absolutely thrilled. They are going to be the first Kerbals to visit another celestial body in this save. They are going to have some of the biggest firsts ever. I mean, well, George has literally got every single first so far. First Kerbal in space, first Kerbal in orbit. She's now going to be the first Kerbal over to the moon. I didn't show it in the video, but she was also the first Kerbal to do an EVA around the moon. I just decided that that wasn't really necessary for the cinematic storytelling that is currently going on. As we arrive at the moon, we fire up those two RL10s again and thankfully they do ignite. Because <laughs> like I said, if they failed now, these guys are dead. They are stone cold dead and there is absolutely nothing that I could do to save them. But the burn is finished and we are in lunar orbit. Amazing. We still have one more burn to go though. I was definitely not really upset that I forgot to hit the pause button on my keyboard to stop Kerbalism notifications coming up during that cinematic segment, but finally we get Earthrise! It's happened! We've got a view of the Earth rising above the moon! That's what Earthrise is, right? And now we're going to stay in lunar orbit for a while just so that we fulfill the contract, fire up those two RL10 engines and by golly they've done it! Amazing! Fabulous! Marvellous! We're on our way back home and the engines haven't failed for the entire duration of this trip. Now, moving the engines offset, as I've mentioned, would be quite useful in case one of them fails, and it's something that I've definitely thought about. You might be surprised to find out that I have never edited this craft, even to the point where I am using this stage as my lunar orbiter for a lunar landing mission. I have not made that fix. And where I am currently, I'm still flying these missions and it's definitely something that I need to go and tell myself I need to fix that as soon as possible. But we were able to enter Earth's atmosphere again and bring these two safely back down home. They're coming home, re- no, that series is, is not dead. I do swear I want to get back to that at some point. It's just going to take me a really long time to get in. I've got far too much on my plate at the moment. But with that mission, we were able to get a huge amount of science. And finally, this is something that I was worried about. I want George Edwards to be the first Kerbal to land on the moon. And her retirement date has been pushed back to a point where that might now be feasible. Anyway, this was me coming into the, the, the mission control building. Had to think about what it was called there for a minute to find out that I only had the option to do a direct lunar landing because I had not completed the first docking contract. If you recall to the last episode, I did that. This is another thing that was plaguing me from changing Earth into Kerbin, but that has now all been fixed. There is no more problems with that. Although having come back in the last week, I have also updated my save again, and I think I have caused myself some even more problems, which I will have to get to deal with in a future episode. But with that absolute smorgasbord of science gained, we unlocked a lot of new technology. I'm not going to go over them, but you can go back and pause the video if you want to see. But now it is time to send a probe to Jupiter. On the 1st of October 1966, yet again on top of a pinnacle launch vehicle, we are going to be launching Shackleton 7, which as the text right there says, it's a, it's a Jupiter orbiter. That's, that's what it's gonna do. It's gonna go to Jupiter and it's gonna fly around it a lot. And actually, I, I'm kind of doing silly voices there, but one really cool thing about this mission that I wanted to be able to do, it's got quite a bit of fuel in its upper stage, more than enough to get an orbit, but also 
I would quite like to visit a vast majority of those Galilean moons. I want to visit maybe all four of them if I can do that. If that's not going to be feasible, well, we'll have to see what happens. But disaster! I lost an engine. I lost one of the RL10s here. It had a 98% chance of ignition, but test flight says no, we're gonna screw you over. Now, ideally, the Pinnacle would have been able to get this all up to orbit. It would have been able to get the Transjovian injection stage as well as, you know, the, the actual bit that gets to Jupiter, the, the, the Jovian whatever stage, I, I don't know, the, the Jovian orbiter. It should have been able to get that up to orbit by itself, but I had to use a bit of the TJO, TJI stage, yes, in order to get up to orbit, which left me with less delta V than I had originally planned. I still have about 6,900 meters per second though which is more than enough to get us over to Jupiter, and we fire that up. And this was honestly a really long burn. Two RL10s providing seven minutes, I think, I think it was about seven minutes if I recall correctly. It took a while, but luckily, due to the magic of video editing, that is all done within the blink of an eye. And Shackleton 7 is on its way to Jupiter, and it's going to be quite a long journey. My original plan was to try and get there as quickly as possible, but due to the rocket failing on ascent and one of those engines going out, I had to take a slightly different route. We're still going to get there pretty quickly, but we're not really going to be seeing that vehicle again until about 1969. Well, there is going to be one slight course correction we do next episode, but it's going to be a while before we get to, you know, the exciting stuff. But now we find ourselves in November and fast approaching the end of this episode. And because it's an episode and I want to get one more launch in, I do something that I would absolutely not do if I wasn't filming this for YouTube. And that is Rush Void 2. I want to get Void 2 out before the end of December and rushing something means you are spending a lot more money on it and you're also not making your launch complex more efficient. This is a very bad idea unless you are really strapped for time. And I wasn't strapped for time, but I just, I want a launch and a launch we shall have because on the 31st of December 1966, Void 2 is ready to go back to the moon. Now, these episodes are done on a yearly basis. That means we are going to see the launch of Void 2, a crude lunar orbiter, but unfortunately, because of the way that I've decided to do these episodes, well, we're not going to see the full mission. You're going to have to tune in next time if you want to see what happens to this, which is definitely not something completely disastrous. Absolutely not. Anyway, the Kerbals on board this mission. We are going to have Jeff, Mr. Blue Lin, and some unknown Kerbal that I cannot for the life of me remember, and I do not show them at any point during this launch. I could go back and check the entire footage, but I really just want to get this voiceover done and finish off this episode so I've got something to release. So there's another thing that you might have to wait until next episode to find out who the other Kerbal is. I'm fairly sure they're another Kerbal that is going to get renamed anyway. So it's not really that important. Anyway, the launch goes flawlessly and we cut off the engines. We have made it to space and now we are going to be burning our way to the moon. Once again, plotting out a really tedious maneuver using Principia. Now, I should have had alarm bells ringing here due to the fact that this maneuver was only gonna take me 3,130 meters per second. That is not enough to get to the moon normally. Well, it depends on how high up in orbit you are when you leave, but usually it's about 3,140, 3,150. And with the engines cutting out there, I can go and see what my trajectory is. And by golly, it's awful. We are 18 million meters away from the moon. That is going to be one heck of a correction burn. A burn that is going to cost us 163 meters per second of delta V. This is a lot. And actually, if I perform this burn, my margins for getting blue and unnamed Kerbal 
are going to be so incredibly tight. I don't know if it can happen. So this is a cliffhanger. What will I do? Will I save the remaining fuel to bring the Kerbals back home safely? Or will I risk the lives of Blue and unnamed Kerbal number 673 by trying to get our lunar orbit? You're gonna have to find out next time.